Hey guys, this is my little slideshow all about Pluto. I'm going to teach you all about Pluto today, and it's going to be awesome. I hope so, anyway. Hope you enjoy my little presentation. So, first off, what is Pluto? Pluto is the second dwarf planet that we ever discovered, after Ceres in the asteroid belt. Although, at the time of its discovery, it was believed to be the ninth planet of the solar system. It orbits past Neptune and like right outside the Kuiper belt. It was initially discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. That's when it was properly discovered with a telescope. Pluto's orbit around the sun takes around 248 years and a day on Pluto is about 153 hours. Um, that's how long it takes to spin around its axis. Pluto's orbit is also a bit sporadic compared to like the planets of the solar system like it at one point it like intercepts Neptune's orbit as in like at one point in its orbit it is closer to the Sun than Neptune would be at that point in its orbit if that makes sense Pluto's surface is composed mostly of nitrogen ice and is negative 387 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 232 degrees Celsius. Pictured here is a close-up of an icy section of Pluto's surface called the Sputnik Planitia. It's to the it's in the west part of Pluto's iconic little heart shape here, so somewhere around here. It's a big icy basin full of ice um, divided up into these little sections. Um, it's pretty fresh. Like, it, it's like the fact that it's so like untouched and unaffected. Uh, like, you can see like Pluto's like scuffed. Like he has um like craters around, but this part is more fresh and like untouched. Which suggests it's like less than 10 million years old. Um, Pluto was discovered. Pluto was discovered. But yeah, it was originally calculated to exist in 1902 by Percival Lowell. Um, who called it Planet X at first as a placeholder name. He calculated, Pluto, he calculated Pluto's existence um, because how Neptune was discovered was that when Uranus was discovered the its orbit was calculated and it was found that its orbit was a little off like something was pulling on it with its gravity and those and and, and Neptune was subsequently discovered from these calculations to be pull, you know, pulling on Uranus's gravity. Percival Lowell did similar calculations and found that there was an additional planet pulling on both Uranus and Neptune, which started his search for it and his search at the Lowell Observatory, which he founded. He, he looked for Pluto for years. He looked for his planet X for years. Um, he, he never ended up finding it in his, in his lifetime, as he died in 1916. Uh, many years later, though, Clyde Tombeau was working at Lowell Observatory and was assigned to find Pluto. Find this planet X that was pulling on Uranus and Neptune. And in 1930, Clyde Tombeau found it. He used an astrograph, which is a telescope combined with a camera, and a blink comparator which is used to view like images in the same spot, like two different images in the same spot so that you can, it's easier to detect movement, like you can blink between them. So he took um, several pictures of the night sky in the same place for a few days, and then he compared them with the blink comparator and found that in, in contrast with these other stars being unmoving, um, suggesting they're very distant. There was this one 
tiny speck that moved, which suggested it was much closer. This planet was um, confirmed to orbit beyond Neptune on average, and therefore was classified as a planet at the time. And the way Pluto got its name is a few days after Pluto was discovered, um, an 11 year old girl named Venetia Burney heard about Pluto in, from her grandpa who read it in the newspaper. She suggested the name Pluto after the Roman god of the underworld and her grandpa liked that name so he forwarded the suggestion all the way up to Lowell Observatory and they liked it as well. There were some other name possibilities but one of them was already in use and the other one's top supporter was an astronomer who like no one liked, so Pluto was the front runner. Clyde Tumbo himself also really liked this name because the first two in the first two letters of Pluto, P L, are the initials of Percival Lowell, who uh, ad, who calculated the existence of of Pluto, presumably at the time. More close up picture of the discovery, the discovery of Pluto. Little speck, little speck. After Pluto was discovered, um, there was some doubt cast on to whether it was the planet X that, that um, was calculated by Lowell or if it was a planet at all. Um, uh, Lowell's original calculations um, predicted the mass of Pluto to be about seven times the mass of Earth for it to pull on Uranus and Neptune in the way that it did. Um, but when it, it was discovered, since it was so faint and small, it was estimated to be about the mass of Earth. So for it to pull on Uranus and Neptune like how it did. But over time, as more observations were performed, it was um, estimated to be even smaller and even smaller. Not, not helping its case, in 1976, Pluto's albedo was calculated. And a planet's albedo is how bright it is, how much light reflects off of it. And it was found to match the albedo of methane ice, which is very reflective and bright. Um, this meant that Pluto appeared a lot brighter in the night sky than, like, its actual size. It made it look bigger, which made Pluto even smaller than it looks in this picture. Like, even, like, even with this distance. And it could, and it was, and that meant that it could not be more than 1% the mass of Earth. Furthermore, in 1978, when, when Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, was discovered, it was used to calculate its mass more accurately, revealing that it was 0.02% the mass of Earth. This meant that it couldn't, it could not have been the planet X affecting Neptune and Uranus's orbits, because it was just like so small. It, it could, it did, it did no, no way it had enough gravity to pull on Uranus and Neptune like that. Um, other astronomers and Tom Bow did um, look for the actual planet X after this, but to no avail. Um, even then, Pluto's mass was further revised one more time to be a bit less. <laughs> In the 1990s, um, we started finding more objects near Pluto. And then we found more, and then we found more. Now we found more, 
But yeah, there were like a ton of these objects, some of which were almost as big as Pluto, some of which were... Yeah, pretty much just only about as big as Pluto. Maybe like as small as about half of Pluto's size. Um, even smaller than that, you can see these objects. Gong Gong, Quayar, Sedna, Orcus, Salacia, 2002 MS. Um, along with like a bunch of other smaller objects, so like asteroids. And this brought into question whether these bigger objects in this belt would be considered planets. Because it seemed that they discovered another belt, like the asteroid belt. They named it the Kuiper belt. Like, there's, like, you know, a bunch of asteroids and other objects, including these, these bigger ones. But there wasn't an exact definition for planets. There was an exact requirement for what a planet had to be to be classified as a planet. Um, so, in 2005, um, a bunch of major astronomers got together to determine exactly what made, excuse me, a planet a planet. What the requirements to be a planet were. In 2006, the International Astronomical Man. In 2006, the International S Astronic Astro I'm, so I'm sorry, it's late at night. The International Astronomical Union published a new set of requirements for a celestial body to be classified as a planet, which ended up excluding Pluto, as well as these other large planetary objects now known as dwarf planets from from the planet loop as well. Um, these three requirements were that the object must orbit the sun, it must be formed into a sphere by its gravity, and it must be able to clear its orbit of other stray objects, either by absorbing them, uh, flinging them out of the way with its gravity, or um, bringing them in and having them orbit it as the moon. Um, Pluto couldn't do that last thing because it was simply too small to have to like clear its whole orbit of other space like random space debris other space objects not to mention it was so close to the Kuiper belt um the the other dwarf planets were a lot closer to the Kuiper belt like in the Kuiper belt so obviously they didn't fulfill that third one either Um, these guys down here did not end up being classified as dwarf planets, but these guys did. Sirius is also a dwarf planet. Um, what kickstarted the initial, like, meeting to define a planet was that when Eris was discovered, it was discovered that it was more massive than Pluto, had more mass, was a little bigger. And now we're going to talk about Pluto's moon. Pluto has five moons, the biggest of which is named Charon. Its four other moons are named Styx, Nyx, Kerberos, or Kerberos and Hydra. Um, these four moons are very small, especially compared to Charon, especially compared to a lot of other things. Um, they're all smaller than New Jersey and a lot of other states, a lot of other places. They can all fit on New Jersey. New Jersey is roughly 40 miles across, uh, east to west. Um, the most interesting of Pluto's moons, though, is probably Charon, uh, the biggest one. Because Charon shares a very unique orbit with, with Pluto. Um, Charon is around half the size of Pluto and almost an eighth of its mass, um, which makes it a lot bigger compared to Pluto than other moons usually are compared to their own planets, which makes their orbit a little different because 
it's more like they're orbiting around each other, like shown here. That's because um, Sharon being, you know, bigger compared to Pluto than with other planets and their moons, um, it pulls on Pluto with its gravity as well. Usually a moon's gravity um, doesn't pull on its planet enough for the planet to be affected because the planet is much bigger. But in Pluto and Sharon's case, instead of the, the, the center of the orbit between them being in Pluto, um, it was in between them, more on Pluto's side because uh, it's bigger. So it pulls more, but Sharon also manages to pull on Pluto. So Pluto orbits in accordance with Sharon as well. Almost like they're doing a little dance. Look at them. They're wonderful, aren't they? They're also tidally locked, which means they're always looking at each other. One side of Pluto is always facing Sharon, and one side of Sharon is always facing Pluto. Like they're dancing. They're spinning around each other. They love each other. You get it? Don't you get it? <laughs> I'm very tired. I love Pluto. I love Pluto and Sharon a lot. But yeah. Thank you for watching my little video. I liked making this this video, this presentation, because I really like Pluto. And I'd like you to ask questions you have in the comments. Like any, any question you have about Pluto, or its moons, or anything like that. Um, it's 1 a.m. Um, so, I'm sorry if I failed to explain anything like completely clearly, but yeah, feel free to ask any questions, any questions you have. I will respond to them at my earliest convenience, which will likely be um, in the next day or so, if you're watching this right when it comes out, or like around when it comes out, yeah. I really appreciate it. Tingle cat out.